two chatbots talked to each other for a while and invented their own language, and now they're talking behind our backs about stuff we didn't even know about. We've created an AI so smart that it outsmarts us all, and we're afraid to release it into the world because it could become dangerous. And the chatbot went online and talked to humans for a while, and it became racist in no time. Are we afraid of AI? I guess most of us are, right? I need a clicker right now. That would be really handy. <laughs> I'm not afraid of AI because it's my passion, and I want to share this passion with you today, at least a little bit, and try to transfer it. So let me take you back to 1995. In 95, I was in Amsterdam, where I'm from, and I got this bright yellow booklet from the University of Amsterdam. It looked really cool and really boring at the same time. So I opened it, and it said law and math, and economics and physics. And on one of the last pages, it said artificial intelligence. I was like, whoa, I've just seen Robocop, and I'm really excited about this. <laughs> so I, I registered on the spot, and uh, no idea what it was, it was getting into. It wasn't a passion of mine yet. But uh, I registered, and I went to the video store, and I rented this VHS tape of Robocop, and I watched it again and again and again, believing that I was actually going to build one. Now, this is the time we're talking about. This is 95, and these machines look really old right now, and these were my friends at the time. And we were playing a LAN game. We connected these computers over something called the Internet, which was fairly new, and we could play games against each other on video cards that would display these, these pictures that we now look at uh, like, whoa, that's shockingly slow. But at that time, this was the best you can get. So at some point, I got kind of yeah, an awkward feeling about my studies because it was mostly math and programming and logic, and I didn't see Robocop anywhere. Uh, this got slightly more interesting by the end because we had strange courses. I followed a course in tonality and punk and house music, trying to come up with algorithms to create punk music and house music at the same time. I did a course on uh, algorithms for dolphin noises. Very interesting stuff, nothing to do with Robocop. <laughs> so I had to graduate at some point, and I picked a topic, um, should have been Robocop again, but it was uh, a children's task, a learning task. It's a balance, and children place weights on these balance, and they have to predict to which side the balance is going to tilt. Now, they learn by just experimenting. So they put some weights, and they see what happens, and then at some point they learn the more weights I put on one side, the likelier it is to go that side. And then over time, they experiment some more, and they learn that also the distance to the center plays a big role in this. And then at some point, there's a big step in learning because they get taught some addition and multiplication in school and they learn that you can just multiply the weight and the distance and you get the winning side, right? Now, this first part, uh, the experimental learning, is very suitable for a, a phenomenon we called neural networks at the time. It's sort of a model that's kind of like the human brain or what we know of it now. Um, and it works with neurons, and they make connections, and they have weights, and that's how they store information. And you train a neural network by showing it examples. Uh, so that's what the children do when they place weights on uh, a balance like that. But at the time, neural networks were a theory. We couldn't use them because we didn't have the computing power or the digital data we collected from the children to train it. So there was kind of disappointment. And this is actually me, and I just learned yesterday night that this is a political post now. Um, <laughs> so, you're welcome. Uh, but at the time, I was slightly disappointed, and maybe you can see it in my face here, like, uh, th this wasn't exactly Robocop I was presenting. And actually, this phenomenon of a, a slight disappointment in AI is what caused what we call the second AI winter, looking back. Uh, and everyone was a bit disappointed because we were talking about AI and, and they created this chess playing computer that won from the world champion and at the same time it couldn't play against a four-year-old kid because it was trained and programmed to win from this one guy. So this lasted a while, uh, about eight years, ten years, uh, where not much happened in AI and we stopped calling a lot of stuff AI, except for robots. Robots survived this first hype, and actually they're in factories now, and they're everywhere. And the funny thing with this AI, artificial intelligence term, is that we stop calling stuff AI as soon as we understand it. So where in the 90s a self-functioning robot was very much AI, now who calls a, a car factory robot AI anymore? It's just something we understand, we know how it works, it stops being AI. Now there's an AI spring. We're back in AI. Uh, in 
around 2012, we figured out that these same computers that we were playing the LAN games on with the video cards, actually these video cards were very suitable for something called deep learning, which is actually neural networks in practice with a lot of layers, that's why we call them deep. Uh, but this caused another hype, right? And uh, a lot of companies got back into it, mostly the Facebooks and Googles of this world, and also me and my friends from back then in university. And we started a product because it was too early to do uh, yeah, B2B stuff in AI. So we had to think of something, a concept that we could just present to the world. So we started AI for fashion recognition. Uh, I want to wear that shirt that Kanye West is wearing, but it's an $8,000 Prada shirt, uh, and it looks just plain white, right? So is there an alternative that I could just buy at Target Market for $10 or something? That's what we built. We didn't do, do the clothing alone, we also did jewelry. Uh, in this case, we accurately recognized the two rings she was wearing uh, behind her windscreen. Uh, and we see a lot of this stuff. Um, we've all experienced it by now, right? You see recommendations, you use chatbots, uh, you do uh, Google image search, etc., etc. So this is how we got back into it. And then at some point, uh, around 2016, we rebranded and we started a company called Brain Creators because it sounded cool and the URL was available. And we started applying this kind of technology for others, helping them to get started on the field. And now today, we're all involved in this. You may not realize it, but in your daily job, you may be collecting data at some point. You may be validating uh, something that a mach machine suggested. You may be in a factory checking stuff, making records of it. And this is all data we can use to train these neural networks, use it as experience to learn from. We're doing that in our daily jobs, but not only in our jobs, we're doing that online when we register for something. We used to do handwriting uh, recognition for Google. You used to correct it manually and say, okay, this is a zero and a seven and whatever. And Google used that to train a uh, handwriting recognition model. And the same with traffic lights and cars and buses, etc., etc. This is you participating in AI training. And there's more. People often ask me, like, are we going to be controlled by robots? Is AI going to take over our lives and tell us what to do? Well, this is already happening. This is Uber. If you've ever taken an Uber, these drivers aren't steered by humans telling them where to go. These are algorithms. These are algorithms telling the drivers where to pick someone up, how to drive, et cetera, et cetera. Even the rate you pay for, uh, for uh, being in the car is automated. Like if there's lots of demand, the rate goes up all algorithms, so we're right there already. Now in 2016, we organized small rooms, small rooms, a bit, bit of a geeky types, uh, explained them about deep learning and how this is getting back into our lives and how we'd been in AI for long and how it's suddenly possible. Small groups, year later, we had corporates interested. Corporates wanted to know, okay, so I can cut costs this way, right? Or can create new propositions or whatever. So they wanted to learn from us, like, what is this AI and how wonderful is it? And then last year, we had these huge conferences where everyone gets involved, like from Microsoft and Dell and Accenture and all the consultancy parties, and they start making up great stories. They start saying, we have responsible AI. It's sort of conscious stuff or uh, we can explain exactly how our black box model works. So you can all use it in finance because it's safe now. And this is all leading up to the hype. And from the previous speaker, we just saw the hype cycle, right? This roller coaster. Well, I feel like since the beginning of this year, we kind of over the top. So we're, the roller coaster is going off into the valley. And I noticed this because some companies are quitting their efforts. Uh, a large bank had a AI center of excellence. They wanted to hire 50 people or so to be AI experts. Now this year, it's down to one data scientist and the whole idea has been scrapped. So we see budgets being cut and yeah, less projects happening actually. And I think the reason for this is because we, we got ahead in our fantasy. We thought, we thought we were building Robocop again. We all thought, right? And people started having these fantasies about robots taking over the world and the who's afraid of AI points. Like what's actually happening with these news items is nothing bad. It's very simple and explainable. Ask me in the break if you want to know. But this is all causing a sort of downward spiral. And this time it's not the robot surviving. This time it's probably going to be machine learning surviving. In this empty room we have now, suddenly we'll have machine learning. We won't call it AI anymore. We'll just call it machine learning because we understand it, right? this is going to survive this time. And the only way to deal with it 
is to gain our own experience. And you're doing that, right? You're training models by helping Google. You're interacting maybe with your uh, device on your phone, your series or your uh, Alexas or whatever. Uh, and you're also creating data. And this is how we should learn by experience, to not fear it, but to embrace it, because it's going to enable nice things for us in the future. Now, speaking of data, uh, data is everywhere. And most companies that approach us say, hey, brain creators, can you build something really cool? We have a lot of data. Just have a look at it and build something awesome. And then we look at the data, and it's pretty much like this. It's everywhere, and it's not labeled. It's just lying around. It's, it's unstructured. We can't do much without it. And that's not their fault. It's because they just don't understand how a neural network, how deep learning, how machine learning works. So to be able to fully leverage it, we should learn about it. Also, this is a problem. These are two of my colleagues. That's Tommaso and that's Jay. Jay is the business guy. Tom is the machine learning guy. They speak a completely different language. And this is happening with customers as well, right? The customer is actually asking, create value, cut cost, make more profit. And the machine learning engineers are saying, are you talking about accuracy scores or what's this? We need to experience machine learning to understand what we're actually talking about. This is another nice example. We need to learn how to interpret results. So in this case, this is very bad for the woman. Um, she had a haircut that looks exactly like an Irish water spaniel. Almost 100% certain of the machine that this is actually a dog. It's bad for her. She can get another haircut, right? But if a machine is only 99% sure of something, uh, suppose it's 99% sure that this is a red light, then still there's a 1% chance that it's actually an orange light or a green light or whatever. So accidents will happen because of this. So we need to learn how to assess what the output of a model is and how we should act, how we should interfere as humans. Because it's not here to take over everything, it's here to suggest an option to us, and in difficult cases we still get to decide. And we need legislation, right? We're using private data here. Uh, your bank is going to assess whether you get a mortgage or not based on your financial account, your bank account, your, your telephone bill, your other stuff in life, your job, whatever. And this could exclude large groups from getting a mortgage at all, or for insurance purposes or whatever. So we need to think about this and not just blindly create AIs that solve everything, but we need to consider whether we want this to be solved by an AI or we still want to be in the loop as a human and whether we can use all the data that's out there or we should be careful with it. The only way to do this is to understand how machine learning works. So we need to experience it again. And then we need to anticipate on a future. Because if we start automating all these parts of our lives, we need to work less. I mean, 40 hours a week, 32 hours a week, that's what we're used to. But in practice, we're doing the same thing over and over again. I find myself checking my email, categorizing it, deciding whether to read it now or later. I find myself writing proposals, same format every time, and maybe one slide, I adjust something, but it takes me an hour to do so. All these tasks can be automated, and they will be. And at some point, I'll find myself not having to work for 32 hours. So how are we going to deal with life where we don't have to work that much? How are we going to deal with life where stuff just happens, right? And our fridge orders our food automatically, and we're just watching Netflix probably. So, but it's something we should think about. And again, we should experience machine learning to be able to understand all this. And then we can spend time on beautiful things. Wealth distribution, how are we going to distribute all the money we have and make sure that only if you work 10 hours a week, you can still go to the supermarket and buy enough groceries to live. We need to think of a new model for society because most of the work is going to be automated. So maybe you spend your time on something else. Do interesting stuff. Find ways to change the planet for the better because machines take care of the daily business. Think about that. And you can only think about that if you understand what we're automating and that it's not dangerous and we're not doing crazy stuff. And in the end, all that machine learning is going to do for us is allow us to be more human. We'll have time to care for each other, be emotional, be creative, do all these cool things, come up with solutions and let machines help in the work. So AI is going to allow us to be more human. Thank you. <laughs>